know, as part of the as part of the syndicate process, we've asked other angel investors in our group, in this case Asher, um, connected us with Connected Signals, which is the first time I'll be seeing this company and I'll be making a decision uh, how involved I want to get in it right now. Matt, you have uh, three minutes on the clock. Three, two, go. Thank you. Um, my name is Matt Ginsberg. I run a company called Connected Signals. The problem we're trying to solve is that it's 2017 and cars don't know what traffic lights are doing. As far as who cares about this, drivers certainly care. When you're stopped at a red light, we can tell you if you have enough time to tune the radio, settle the food fight your kids are having in the backseat, whatever. Car makers care about this. We're actually working with the EPA now to ensure that when they deploy this stuff, they actually can credit it on the MPG stickers that are on all the cars you buy. Transportation networks, networking organizations care about this. When Uber tells you that your rider, your driver is going to arrive in four minutes, that four minutes has to be right. But the last four minutes of a trip are totally dominated by whether the lights are red or green. And lastly, autonomous car makers care about this. When Uber rolled out their autonomous vehicles in San Francisco a couple of months ago, they immediately ran two yellow, two red lights. They were both caught on film. It was incredibly embarrassing. This is a very hard problem that all of these guys have to solve. As far as where the data comes from, it turns out there are, just, there are really just two ways you can get this data. You can get it from the traffic lights directly, or you can get it from cameras. And in both cases, Connected Signals is pretty squarely at the middle of all of these operations. So part of what we do is we get data from our municipal partners. We currently get live data for about 12,000 traffic lights on three continents. And then we pass that to everybody who's interested. So we can tell a driver, the light you see if it's 100 yards in front of you and it's green, you're going to make it. You don't have to speed up. We can help the OEMs with better navigation. We can help Uber. We can help the autonomous car, car makers by giving them an alternative source of information about the state of any particular light they're about to hit. And lastly, we have proprietary algorithms that take video data and produce traffic light information from that. And as far as we can tell, the algorithms we have are substantially better than what the car makers are currently using. Their video we work with is higher resolution, so we can see the lights from further away. We analyze it more quickly, and the error rates are lower. A little bit about barriers to entry here, because this obviously matters. The way cities push data to us, we've, we give them a device. We have this little Raspberry Pi machine, costs us 60 bucks. We hand it out. It's patent pending, and it appears to be becoming sort of the standard for how people do this. And lastly, all of the algorithms we use to analyze this data are patent pending as well. In terms of revenue, you can see the numbers. I mean, the bottom line here is there are about 18 million cars sold every year in the United States. We'll see between $10 and $60 on those. Uber gives 5.5 million rides a day, and everybody has a cell phone. So um, I am done. Great. That thing should go off. All right. But, my Stanford faculty background is going to show here. So I've got two silent videos that I want to play during the Q&A part. One of them is I can show you what the traffic lights in San Jose are doing right now. I'll put up a little map. And the other is an AV, a silent AV demo showing what information we would give to an autonomous car. The San Jose demo is better than it sounds, and the AV demo is worse than it sounds. Who wants to see the, the traffic lights in San Jose? You've got to raise your hands. Yeah, of course. Let's do it. And who wants to see the AV stuff? <laughs> All right. Okay, traffic lights it is. One last thing, this is about to go away. Dennis at Connected Signals, our executive chairman, he's here with me. He's had a couple of successful exits. He's way better at the money stuff than I am. Okay. So you went one minute over, so I'll take one minute from your QA. We'll have five minutes for QA, and let's run a microphone. Ed will go first, and then Jed. Five minutes on the clock. Hi, I'm Ed Roman. I, I manage an angel syndicate. Um, really love what you're up to. It's a really interesting business. A um, couple questions. One is, do you have a target, like, first beachhead market that you might pursue out of all those customers you outlined? And then second is, is there a, uh, a challenge in terms of getting these deals done with local municipalities? Is that sales cycle lengthy? So in terms of initial beachhead, we are in negotiations with two automakers right now. They're both planning on rolling this functionality out in their 2019 model year cars. So that's gonna be first. In terms of making the deals with the cities, the sales cycles can be anywhere from a few days to 
I started talking to LA two years ago and they haven't agreed yet. So lots of variation. The fact that we're getting 12,000 lights is a huge step up here. The fact that we're helping with autonomy is a huge step up. We're going to start a bike thing. Cities love multimodal. So we listen to their problems and the better we listen and the more we do, the faster they move. Also, uh, another question. Yeah, Jed Katz from Javelin Venture Partners. Is there a, um, what is the latency between getting the data from the traffic light up to the cloud down to the car? Uh, that's, that's you know, because a second or two makes a difference at that point. That's a great question. The answer is from the time the light changes in the sky till the time I can put it on your phone is a little under a second. If you think about it, traffic lights have been designed to deal with single second latencies. That's why they have yellows. So every application we've ever tried to field, a one second latency is not a problem. How, Jim Lauterbach from Social Starts. How does the uh, revenue work? Is it a monthly subscription? Can you and also can you uh, repurpose or can you reprogram existing cars to go in via ODB or something like that? So uh, we can work via smartphones for automakers who can do much more with the data than we can, including getting cafe credits from the government. They're all asking us for fleet wide pricing. So we tell them this much money per car. As long as you keep doing business with us, we'll keep supporting all your vehicles. Another question. Hey, Kevin from Funders Club. Uh, you talked about the unit economics on the revenue side for the costs of the traffic lights and the cameras. Um, can you talk there how much you're paying for each? I'm assuming the cameras are also privately owned. We have never paid a city anything. We don't plan on paying a city anything. Um, occasionally, some intermediate sized cities decide the universe revolves around them and they ask us for money and we tell them no. The cameras, we don't get data from the cameras. Those are the cameras that are feeding autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicles, as I imagine everybody knows, are just piled with cameras. Great. Real quick, does it does it just notify the the driver that the light is about to turn red, and then you get a some sort of uh, we actually you know, nudge or something? What we actually do on the interface side is um, the best thing to do is to put up a speedometer or use the speedometer the the automaker already has, and we put a green arc. If you go that speed, you'll hit the next light green or a red arc. And behind that arc is another little arc. It's like Tetris. If you go that speed, you'll hit the next light green. So you can actually get into the green wave and just, you know, it's like green, green. It's exactly what you want if you're driving on a time corridor. Um, is there any, uh, it's Jason Calacanis, um, angel investor and host. Is there any concern that you've gotten from municipalities that this will induce bad behavior? And how do you address that? In other words, if I see that the light's changing in three, two, do I gun it and go above the speed limit to try and make it? I am so glad you asked that. Um, so there are multiple answers. We are right now in the middle of a study with Argonne National Laboratory to figure out exactly what the driver's re response to each of these various information is. And what we're going to do is we're obviously going to give drivers information that makes them better behaved and withhold information that makes them worse behaved. And the other thing we do is whenever we have a countdown, you know, the light's going to be red in 37 seconds, that countdown stops at five. We do not want people seeing the countdown hit zero and off they go drag racing. It stops at five. It makes you look at the light because the only way you can really know if the light's green is you've got to look at it. Great. Let's take a final question. Did somebody have a final question? Okay, Clara. And Clara specializes in cities. Hi, yeah, I'm Clara. I'm the co-founder of the Urban Innovation Fund. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. I'm just curious, why wouldn't you pay cities for data if ultimately you're able to de deliver such a great product? Like, wh why not? Um, the short answer is we don't have to. Everybody is anxious. All the cities have open data initiatives. They all want to get the data out there. We pay the cities in odd ways. So one of the things we do for all of our city partners is once they give the data to us, we will rebroadcast re it to anyone they want to. We won't charge them. We won't insert latency. So the cities don't have to make new holes in their firewalls. They don't have to w worry about network bandwidth. They've solved all their problems forever. So the, that's how we pay them. Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about a great product, which you've probably heard about, but maybe you haven't tried yet, and I have tried it, and I love it. It has become a big hit in my household with my seven-year-old daughter. It's called BlueApron.com. My wife loves it, too. Go to BlueApron.com slash twist, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is an incredible experience. You get a box. 
It's obviously refrigerated, and all the ingredients and a beautiful menu card and a recipe card of how to make the product. So I've always wanted to make pizza at home. I've never done it. I mean, I made English muffin pizzas. You know, this is what we call Irish pizza when you grow up in Brooklyn. But they sent a beautiful pizza dough and beautiful sauce and cheese and everything, all perfectly portion sized and an easy to follow recipe. Then the other thing I've always wanted to learn how to cook is General Tso's chicken. That was one of my favorites when I was in New York and I was living on the west side in Hell's Kitchen. I walk home from the garden after watching the Knicks win a playoff game. I get General Tso's chicken. I never knew how to make it. They give you all the ingredients, a little cornstarch, so all these little syrups, and you like a little uh, professional chef, everything just goes smoothly. It is an incredible experience. It's also affordable. You get a ton of variety. It's super flexible. You get the deliveries when you want. Um, and it really, it, I was just amazed by the quality of the bok choy, of the chicken. Everything was the highest quality. And it saves you not only from going to the supermarket, not only from getting a recipe, but also the portion sizes and, and how to put this all together. It makes cooking delightful again. And they are in partnership with 150 local U.S. farms, fisheries, ranchers. And they, you know, so I'm a big seafood fan and we love going to the Monter Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium. And when I went there last time, they had this beautiful card that told you which fishes you should order, which are sustainable. But it's very hard to, to actually get that uh, certified. You know, people lie when they sell you fish. You don't know what you're getting. You don't know if it's actually sustainable or not. And even some of the stuff that's farm raised is actually not good for the environment. Well, you know what? Blue Apron takes all that away. They do all of that important work for your family. And it's very important to our family that we order sustainable stuff and we and we don't take stuff from the ocean that's not sustainable. It's a, it's a big movement uh, amongst considered people. So the fact that they use the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch list to me and their standards is very impressive. Um, prep is, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It's super, I mean, we did it faster in some cases, but we're fast cooks. Um, it tastes great. It's easy. It's a better way to cook. It is a better way to cook. Just, and also delicious. I mean, I made this beautiful Sicilian pizza and my daughter ate it all. It was one of those great experiences where we, you know, she was looking in the oven, counting the minutes. So blueapron.com slash twist, blueapron.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is amazing. All right, let's get back to this amazing program. 